Mm -hmm. All right, everybody, I have 10 o'clock. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started here, even though we have barely a quorum, but hopefully enough people to get it going. Uh, let me just uh, update you here a little bit. Uh, you guys look so sad. Uh, I don't know. It's <laughs> the last day of class, right? It's like, oh, no, this is the last time we get to listen to Dr. Ann and talk about math. Uh, no, it isn't. You just have to become a math major and take a bunch more classes. That would work just great. Uh, no. Uh, anyway, um, yes, this is our last regular class, um, and we are five days out from the final, actually. So let me um, tell you what I'm planning to do for today. Um, I'm going to cover one last section here. Uh, that we haven't gotten to yet. This shouldn't only take uh, 30 or 40 minutes. It won't be too long, less than half of the class period. The rest of the time, um, I'm going to get onto Canvas and show you all of the resources for the final exam, talk about the final exam a little bit. Uh, and of course, I'm also going to give you back your midterms, uh, which I finally uh, got those graded pretty late last night. Um, and we'll just sort of take stock of where we're at with everything and um, what's coming up for the next uh, five days, I guess it would be. Uh, but before I do all of that, I think I would like to start by just covering this uh, one last section here that we have not done yet. Um, this will take, as I said, only maybe 40 minutes uh, at the most here. And this is about non-homogeneous linear systems of differential equations. So you remem remember that for most of chapter nine, we've been looking at this system here, x prime equals ax. Right, And we learned how to solve it when A is defective and when A is not defective, both cases. But we didn't have this sort of plus B on the end of it, which is this non-homogeneous part to the system of differential equations. So there's this potential to have a vector B of T. Everything here, by the way, is functions of T. And that vector could be tacked on to the end of your linear system. And this makes it a non-homogeneous linear system of differential equations. And what I'd like to go over with you guys today is just, well, how would you solve a non-homogeneous linear system of differential equations? And the method to solve it is something that you are very familiar with. One of the reasons I like to cover this section is that it reinforces uh, some techniques that we actually have already learned before. And the method that we're going to use to solve this is uh, a word that I'm sure you are quite familiar with now, variation of parameters. So there's a variation of parameters method in chapter nine as well. And that's what we're going to we're going to talk about. And uh, there is a very familiar looking three step process that this variation of parameters method is part of. So I'm going to explain the three-step process. It's going to sound extremely familiar as a three-step process that you've seen before. First of all, we're going to solve the corresponding. So step one, solve the corresponding homogeneous system. So this is step one, and the, the homogeneous system is just x prime equals a times x. So the first step is to solve that, solve this hor corresponding homogeneous system, um, x prime equals ax, for what I like to call, as always, the complementary function. So we're going to solve this for the complementary function. And that is what we write as x sub c of t, the complementary function, okay? So this part we already know how to do, right? This is what we learned already in chapter 9. x prime equals ax. You had a bunch of those on your, on your midterm just on Tuesday, right? So we could solve that as step 1. The step 2, uh, you won't be surprised, right? Step 2 is going to look pretty familiar as well. We need to find one particular solution, particular solution, this is going to be written x sub p of t, one particular solution uh, to the non-homogeneous system x prime equals a times x 
plus B. And over here in your notes, you might just add C below, because this is what we're going to be explaining below in just a moment, uh, how we are going to do, to do that part. So we have to find one particular solution to the non-homogeneous system. And then the third step is where we're going to write down the general solution. Anybody have an idea what that's going to be? Exactly. We just do what we did in chapter eight uh, in this version of the uh, three-step process as well, which is we just write down x of t equals x sub c of t plus x sub p of t. So the complementary function plus the particular solution. So that's going to be it. And that gives us the general solution to our system. So right here, my friends, we have outlined uh, the three-step process. It should be, look very familiar to you. We did the same thing in Chapter 8 when we had a non-homogeneous nth order differential equation to solve, right? We first found the complementary function. Then we found one particular solution. And finally, we added them together. Three steps. One, two, three, like so. All right. So does that make a little bit of sense? Let's talk about step two, because step two is where it's all at. That's the new material here. Step one is very familiar to us already. Step three is really nothing to do. It's just step two that we need to address. So I'm going to do that right here. Uh, and this won't take very long. I just want to show you how step two works and then maybe do one example. And then we'll be good with this uh, section. Um, before we uh, outline exactly what we're going to do in step two, I'm going to rewrite the complementary function from step one. So this x sub c of t here, right? We, we actually already know what it would look like. It's going to be a linear combination of n. I should emphasize here this is an n by n matrix A to begin with, right? So there will be n terms here, c1, x1 of t, plus c2, x2 of t, and dot, dot, dot. We keep adding these terms up. The last one is cn times xn of t. And I can actually write that uh, linear combination in a slightly more compact way if I just make a matrix out of this thing. So what I'm going to do here, guys, is I'm going to make columns out of these uh, basis solutions, x1, x2, and so on, up to xn of t. I'm going to make a, a matrix out of that. And I'm going to right multiply it by a column of constants. OK, so um, I'm rewriting my linear combination. Right? This is the usual thing. I, I, I have a linear combination of my basis solutions. Again, we know how to find the complementary function. We did that in the previous sections. And all I want to do now is rewrite that linear combination in a little bit fancier way here. If you were to do this matrix multiplication, right, as we know how to do that, we go across the rows of the matrix on the left, and we take dot products with the column on the right. And what you'll notice as you do those dot products is that the C1, for example, is only ever going to be getting multiplied by things from the first column because you're going down this way, the first entry of your dot product has a C1 here times something from way over here, right? Well, that's just C1 and X1 being multiplied together, essentially, right? And then as I go to the next term, we add C2 times X2, right? The second entry of this column only feels the numbers in the second column of this matrix as you do that row uh, dotted with that column. So C2, X2, which is another one of my terms. And so this is just rewriting it. Uh, I'm not doing any math here other than just expressing the uh, linear combination differently in this format. This thing right here, this matrix that has all of the solutions kind of laid out into the columns, is something I mentioned in passing in one of my earlier videos that you watched. It was called, does anybody remember what it was called? Just wondering. I didn't put it on the test, and I didn't really emphasize it all that much. One more time. Funda the fundamental matrix. That's exactly what it was called. This is actually the, what's called the fundamental matrix, and it's being multiplied here by the vector of constants C1 through Cn. That's exactly right. So this thing here 
just as a quick reminder, this is just terminology. It's called the fundamental matrix. That's right. So there's your, your fundamental matrix, X of T. Okay, so that is all just the background. Now, we have to come up in step two, which is what we're talking about now, with one particular solution, right? And so one last time for Math 250B, we are going to guess a trial solution for the particular solution. And it's going to be called, it's going to be called variation of parameters. This is what I mentioned here. This method is called variation of parameters. And how did that work in chapter eight? Uh, how did variation of parameters work? We had this complementary function C1, Y1, plus C2, Y2. And then what we did in chapter eight, when we wanted to do variation of parameters, is we guessed the particular solution to be U1, Y1, plus U2, Y2. And then there were conditions on the U's that you had, uh, that we had to derive. Uh, so guess what, guys? I'm going to do the same thing here. All that happened in this chapter was the C's got replaced by the U's, which we had to figure out after the fact. So we're going to do that here as well. So we are going to guess. We will guess. By the way, guys, there's two equations in this section that you have to know. And I'm going to put boxes around them and make them really obvious. And this is the first one. The particular solution is going to be capital X times U. So I'm going to do the same thing that I did in chapter eight, where I turned all the Y's into, I turned the Y, sorry, the C1 and the C2 into U1 and U2. Here, I'm just going to turn the C into a U. It's the same kind of philosophy. And this is going to be where U is to be determined. It's going to be to be determined. Okay, so we're going to have to work that out. Um, now, I wanted to make a quick uh, note. Uh, well, I'm actually going to do this part now. How do I determine what U is? Um, essentially, what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to make a quick note here that if I was to take A times capital X. Okay, so you may not know exactly where this is coming from, but trust me, this is going to be important. Okay, if I want to know what A times X is, that's just A times this matrix of columns, which are the functions X1 through Xn that we had in uh, step one. I'm just going to lay out what capital X is there. The fundamental matrix, right? Capital X is just this fundamental matrix. Now, when you do this matrix multiplication, again, you go across the rows of A and down the columns of the fundamental matrix, and you'll just create columns of the form AX1, and then AX2, and then dot, 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 up to AXN. It's going to look just like that. So you end up taking the matrix A and multiplying it by each individual column one at a time, down those columns. Okay? That's what it's going to be. Does anybody know what AX1 is equal to? Or any of these columns we have here? The first what? First, first step. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, guys. X1, X2, X3. What were they? Those were solutions to the corresponding homogeneous differential equation. So what is AX1 equal to? It's equal to X1 prime, right? And AX2 is X2 prime. AX3 is X3 prime, right? This, these are just the derivatives of these Xs. And this is just on a column by column basis. We're just literally taking the derivatives. And this is, so this is just, this is just since, the derivative of xi is a times xi. Those were solutions to the original homogeneous system of differential equations. Well, now what I'm doing here is I'm just literally taking the derivative of everything. So this just gives me the derivative of the entire fundamental matrix, capital X. 
That's right. So what is my note really saying here? My, <coughs> excuse me, my note is just saying a times x is the same as x prime. And I'm gonna need that in just a second. I'm not just doing this for kicks. There's a reason for it. <laughs> okay, so now what I would like to do is try out my guess here, okay? What does that mean? I'm gonna plug my guess into both the left side and the right side of the problem that I'm working on right up here, this non-homogeneous system. So let's do that. Let's plug x prime into the differential equation. You know what? I might make a little star here for your notes. So I'll put a little star. I'm going to come back to the original equation here and label it with a star if that's okay. So in your notes, it might be helpful if you have labeled this with a star right here because I'm going to refer to it back over here again. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to plug this in. On the left side, I have to take the derivative of this, right? The derivative, so what am I doing? I'm going to plug the x sub Actually, I didn't really mean to say the derivative of x here. I'm so sorry. This really should just be plug x sub p, right? I really want to plug this thing. That's what I meant to say. I want to plug this x sub p into my differential equation, okay? So on the left side, that would give me the derivative of x sub p. And on the right side, that would give me a times x sub p plus b. So I'm going to plug it in on both sides. And this is the guess that we're using. So that means that what we have is actually capital X times U prime being set equal to A times capital X times U plus B. All right. And what do I see here on the left side? I see a, uh, I see a derivative of a product. Okay, that sounds like the product rule, right? The product rule right here. So this is going to be x times, uh, let's do it this way, x prime times u plus x times u prime. This is just the product rule right here, okay? And this is supposed to be equal to a times x times u plus b. And what is my goal right now? My goal is to figure out what u is. And I've claimed that we're basically already going to have it. You see anything we can simplify over here? Keep in mind, we did a note here. There's a note on the board that we just uh, kind of jotted down a moment ago. What did we say here? We said that a times x is the same as x prime. Does that have any bearing on what we see over there? Uh, Blake? You could change the a to x prime to oh, Right. And then what could we do if we did that? Yeah, yeah, I'm just going to do it really simply, guys. X prime is the same as AX, and they're both being multiplied by U. So guess what? I can just cancel them. I can actually just cancel them. So I can cancel, I, just, I can just cancel, and this is since AX is equal to X prime, right? So we can just cancel for that reason. That's the idea there. Oh, and that means if I want to solve for, so what am I left with? Oh, wow, this is getting really simple. X times U prime equals B. That's all that's left. And my goal is to solve for U. Oh, that means I need to get U by itself. Well, one thing I need to do to get U by itself is to get this X out of the way. But guys, X is this fundamental matrix whose columns are these linearly independent solutions that we found in step one. That fundamental matrix, my friends, is actually invertible. It has an inverse. And so I'm just going to say, since capital X is invertible, we can solve for U prime. It would be X inverse times B. 
Right, okay. And that's the derivative of what u is. And of course, what I wanted to know is, well, what is u itself? And to get that, what am I going to need to do as a last step? Integrate. integrate both sides. Exactly. So then we can integrate. We can integrate and we get u equals the integral of x inverse times b. That's the formula. And notice I'm putting it in a box. I, I said that there were two equations that you need to know in order to be able to do section 9.6. And I've got them in boxes here. This is the, the form of the particular solution that we need to know. And then we have to know how to get u. And we get u by just doing this integral right here. That's it. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. And that will work. And as soon as I have the u, I just plug it here and I get my fundamental solution. And so that's step two. And then as we've already talked about, step three is nothing new. We just add together the results of steps one and two. So I think we just need to do an example of this and then I'm gonna feel pretty good about it. Are there any questions though with the, with the derivation here? Yeah, Marco? Uh, you said yes for uh, the particle one. By yes. Using the U1, U2. I was motivating why I'm going to change the C to a U here because that's how we did it in the variation of parameters that we learned in chapter eight. We took C1 and C2, which were constants, and we replaced them with uh, U1 and U2, which were the unknowns that we had to determine. So honestly, this is the same strategy that we used in chapter eight to do variation of parameters. The same strategy. The only difference here is now we have vectors instead of scalars. But it's the exact same strategy in chapter eight, right? You guys all know this. Everybody got this right on the exam. When you when you want to solve for u in chapter eight, you have a, both a u1 and a u2. We derived what they are, right? So we had we had these formulas that we all used uh, to do variation of parameters in the previous chapter. So now this is just the chapter nine version of it. Okay, so it's the same same exact idea one more time. Okay, if everybody, and by the way, you don't have to remember anything I've said today other than the two things in the boxes. So if you really want to know like uh, how to do this uh, process, you just have to memorize those boxes and you're good to go. By the way, I always uh, do this every semester, which is that I am going to promise that there will be one of these on the final um, because there's so much good stuff from 250B that goes into this. You can just see it everywhere. You have to find, what do you have to be able to do? You have to be able to find an inverse of a matrix. You have to be able to multiply matrices together. You have to remember the three-step process of variation of parameters. There's a lot of good uh, meat in this section. And so I always um, sort of promise that I'm gonna give people one of these to do uh, on, on the exam. I think the hard part about this section is just that it does take a bit of patience because you have to work out a problem that already could feel like it's going to take a while, right? Which is just step one. And then you've got to do this whole thing where you find the inverse of this fundamental matrix and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it does take a little bit of time and it can be easy to kind of get lost in the process. Let me recopy this uh, X of P right here. And kind of keep it on the board with us. These are the two equations, right? These are the two equations that everybody needs to know. Let's try an example, and then I'm going to be ready to just uh, call, it a, call it a semester. <laughs> okay, we'll just do one example here. Uh, let's find the general solution to uh, the following system x prime equals a times x plus b, where, well, let's write down the, the matrix A. I'm going to use this matrix here. It's going to be 2 and negative 1, and then negative 1 and 2. And then uh, b is going to be a vector. It's always going to be represented as a column vector. And let's just use 0 and then 4e to the t. Remember that there's a T hiding behind everything here, right? And when I'm taking derivatives, it's with respect to T. When I'm thinking about uh, the fundamental matrix, it's a function of T. There's really T's that are gonna be 
embedded into everything that we're going to be doing here. Okay, so let's get into it here, guys. Let's get into the solution. Is everybody with me? Any questions so far? Okay, so far so good. So uh, let's do step one. I guess I'll go to my blue marker here. Let's do step one. Step one is where we have to solve the corresponding homogeneous system. Okay, we've already learned how to do that part. We need to find the eigenvalue eigenvector pairs, right? So, by the way, as we're solving this problem, guys, I want you to just reflect on how much of Math 250B is called upon, right? So right now we're going to do a determinant and find eigenvalues, right? And eigenvectors through the null spaces. So there's already a ton of stuff just right here at the beginning. The determinant of, so this is the matrix that we get when we subtract lambda off of the main diagonal of the matrix. And so I'm gonna use my two by two formula here, two minus lambda times two minus lambda and then minus one. I'm gonna go ahead and expand that all the way out. So it becomes lambda squared minus four lambda plus three as I totally foil that completely out. And then this actually factors nicely as lambda minus three times lambda minus one. And so I can see what my lambda values are pretty easily just by looking at it, yeah? Okay, so uh, my lambda values are three and one. I'm going to go ahead and give myself room to work on these eigenspaces here in a second. Three and one, those are the lambdas. And I'm going to try and do this in the same order that I did in my notes because it does make a little bit of a difference. So for lambda equals three, uh, as you guys know, we have to find this null space. And uh, how does that set up? Well, we subtract three off of the main diagonal of A. Right, so if I subtract three off of the main diagonal of A, we just get negative ones everywhere in the matrix here. Okay, so these are my uh, eigenspaces. And then I'm gonna find the eigenvector, I'll call it V1, which uh, I'm just gonna, well, you can cross off a row. You can set up a free variable if you want, but I think I'm going to just go ahead and do my AB switch trick uh, to get the eigenvector without having to write anything down. So there's the first vector. And then I'm actually gonna go ahead and write down the first solution now, x1 of t, which is e to the three t times the vector negative one, one. Go ahead and put a box around that one right there. Okay, there's the first solution. That's x1 of t. All of this is just review, right? This is stuff we had learned how to do previously. Uh, we're just uh, having to rehash it here a little bit. Uh, for the other eigenvalue, lambda equals one, this time I subtract one off of the main diagonal of the matrix that we are given. And if I subtract one off of the diagonal of A, I just get this right here. Again, I have to be able to cross off a row. That's a no brainer. I'll just go ahead and cross off the second row. And again, I'm gonna do my A, B switch trick with the numbers one and negative one. I swap the order of them and do a sign change on one of them. Most people were getting that pretty well on the exam, uh, but there's still a few people who I think are a little shaky. Of course, on the exam, it was a three by three. This is only a two by two. By the way, I'm probably only going to ask you this for a two by two. Um, the reason is without a calculator or a computer, it would be pretty difficult to find the inverse of a three by three matrix that was filled with functions. Um, I mean, we have learned how to find the inverse of a matrix, of course. Uh, we have the adjoint method from way back in September, uh, as well as the Gauss-Jordan method. But both of those methods were already kind of um, technically messy, even when the matrix is just filled with numbers. Um, so I really am hesitant to ask you to do one of these by hand for a three by three system just because of this thing here. Um, so more than likely, you're going to see a two by two on uh, the final on Tuesday of this type. And with a two by two, the A, B trick is really very easy. You just swap the two numbers and do a sign change on one of them. And then you get your eigenvector 
And we'll build our second solution here, which is just going to be x2 of t equals e to the t times 1, 1. Everybody with me? That's, uh, that's basically step one, more or less. Um, of course, we can write down the complementary function, c1 times e to the 3t times negative 1, 1, plus c2 e to the t times 1, 1. Everybody okay? So far, everything in blue is old material. It's just reviewing. We're just practicing on, a, on an easy example of a two-by-two two homogeneous system. So that's step one. That is step one, okay? I'm going to start step two if I don't hear any, any objections so far with the first part. <laughs> we so far so good? So step two is to write down the particular solution, and we have that here, this is in the box. We need the fundamental matrix. Actually, it shows up in both of these important equations. I would suggest for step two that the first thing we actually do is write down the fundamental matrix. So I'm gonna go ahead, that's the capital X. And how does that get constructed again? Uh, the columns, I guess I erased it, but the capital X just has these uh, individual uh, solutions from step one laid out in columns. So the first column would be the first vector up there, which is negative e to the 3t and 3e to the 3t. So you actually want, in this case, you're going to want to put that e to the 3t into the slots of the vector so that it lays out as a column like so uh, into your matrix here. And then the second column of your fundamental matrix is just built out of the second solution here, and that's just going to be e to the t, e to the t, like so. That's your fundamental matrix, okay? Now, uh, what we actually are going to need is not just the fundamental matrix, but also its inverse, right? So uh, what I would recommend you do next is just write down the inverse of this fundamental matrix. Does anybody remember... This is a good review for the final, actually. Does anybody remember if we have a two by two matrix and we want the inverse of it? Uh, this was a formula that we had to learn way back in September for the first exam. And I'm wondering if uh, people still have that kind of in their mind a little bit, uh, Marco? Um, it's not times the original matrix. Uh, Audrey? There we go. We swap the A and the B, D, and then we put minus signs on the B and the C. So this is uh, another one of those things that might be not in the front of everybody's mind because it's been a, about 10 weeks since we had an exam on this, but this would be worth uh, kind of refreshing your memory about. That's the formula for the inverse of a two by two, and I'm going to try to use it right here to get the inverse of my fundamental matrix. I'm going to try to write down the inverse of the fundamental matrix now. Um, actually, let me just put it over here so that it's not in the way. So we're going to get one over. Okay, so now we have to be careful with this calculation. AD minus BC. So E to the 3T times E to the T is actually E to the 4T. I have a negative of that here, and then I have to subtract it again on the BC part. So it's actually negative two factors of e to the 4t. Try to make sure if, if I'm going too fast on this, please slow me down. I'm kind of doing some stuff in my head. AD is right here, and then BC is right here. The AD has a negative e to the 4t, and the BC has an e to the 4t. And by the time you subtract those, you will have subtracted two of those e to the 4t factors. Right, and that goes in the denominator uh, according to my two by two inverse form. Then I have to swap the diagonal numbers. So the e to the t trades places with negative e to the three t. And then I have to do sign changes on the b and the c entries, but no uh, swapping. So just negative e to the t and negative e to the three t. So there you go. Um, and so far, that looks just fine. Now, um, if you want, you can multiply this 
uh, scalar, this is a scalar out in front, you are certainly free, if you would like to, to multiply it into all four slots of the matrix. It's like a scalar multiplication. You don't have to do that. Uh, it's actually okay to leave it kind of out in front for the time being. I mean, the next thing I want to do with the inverse of x is I want to multiply it by b, because I'm trying to figure out what u is right now. So to multiply it by b, I don't really need to multiply this denominator into all the slots. And so I'm actually not going to do that. It just doesn't really help, help to do that. So let's see if we can work out x inverse times b now. Okay, so I'm literally going to just recopy the x inverse the way it already has been written. I'm going to do that first. So I'm just recopying again, guys, not doing any math, just recopying what's already here. All right, I just recopy that. And then I'm going to multiply this by B. And B was given to me. I haven't used this yet. This is the first time I'm going to now use the B vector, which just has a zero on top and a 4e to the t on the bottom, like so. OK, so that's going to be it. Let me come up here. I'm going to leave that scalar part out in front for the time being. I'm not going to try to shove it into the matrix at all. And I just want to do this matrix multiplication. So I'm just going to do my, my usual dot product of matrix multiplication. So on the top slot, I will have 0 minus 4 e to the 2t. OK, so let's make sure everybody's with me on this. I'm going across this row and down this column and doing a dot product. So that gives me negative 4 e to the 2t. And then on the bottom entry, I also have a 0 here and then a minus 4 e to the 4t. OK, so you just have to be a little careful with all of this. But that is going to be the x inverse times b. And now, if you have not done so already, now is the time to feed that scalar into the slots of this vector, right? This is going to be the time to do that. Notice all the minus signs are going to go are going to get canceled. Also, there's factors of four canceling with one half out in front. So in the top slot, uh, I'm actually just going to get two times. Now, here you have to be a little careful. This is e to the 2t on top, e to the 4t on the bottom. So that actually has a net total of negative two, uh, 2t uh, as the exponent there. So e to the negative 2t. That's in the top slot. And then what is the bottom slot going to be? Two. Just two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just two. Because uh, everything on the bottom slot just gets cut down by the, uh, the minus sign cancels. The 4 divides into the two and the exponentials cancel. That's it. That is your x inverse times b. Now we have to integrate that. So see, this is why I'm saying that there's a lot of steps here and you can't uh, allow yourself to get lost like in the process. So just be careful. This is x inverse times b. So then u will be the integral of x inverse times b, which is the integral of this vector that we just wrote down, negative two, uh, sorry, 2e to the negative 2t and 2. And this is going to be integrated with respect to t here. Right? And now I'm just going to integrate both slots. I just have to integrate both slots here. And um, the top slot is integrated with a little u substitution, right? You could just let u equal a negative 2t. And uh, the derivative of that is negative 2. But we have a 2 here. We just don't have the minus sign. So I'll put the minus sign in there, and I'm going to get negative of e to the negative 2t. You can always check. If you take the derivative of this, you should get back to here again, right? Because you're integrating to go from here to here. And when I integrate 2, I just get 2t. The antiderivative of 2 is just 2t. Uh, as we've mentioned many times throughout the semester, Whenever we're just finding a particular solution, we don't need to add plus C to these antiderivatives. We, we can just assume that those constants are zero and leave them off. So in this case, we could just be good to go with what we have right here. Is this okay so far? It's an indefinite integral, right? There's no limits of integration here. We're just finding antiderivatives. And we can just choose zero for our constant of integration.
Awesome. So that is you. That is the you. And I'm going to erase this now. <laughs> because the last step now is to write down the particular solution by using this equation, x times u. OK, so let's do it. The particular solution, x sub p, is capital X times u. So let's write down capital X again. It was written at the beginning of step two over there. It's this two by two matrix. Just write this down. And we're going to multiply that by u. u is what we just worked out right here. It's just that column right there. And I just have to do this calculation now. I have to multiply this two by two matrix by this two by one column. Okay, so I go across the rows here, down the column of this guy. Let's just get the answer here. We're going to get uh, e to the 3t times e to the negative 2t is actually just e to the t. And then plus 2t e to the t. And on the bottom slot, we'll have a minus sign with this e to the 3t and e to the negative 2t, which again is just e to the t. And then plus 2t e to the t again. That would be the... Um, entries. Let me just double check that that's what I got. It certainly is. It certainly is. So that is your particular solution. Just a quick little caution here. Uh, because the expressions are kind of long, some people start getting confused and they think, well, that looks like a two by two matrix over here. Uh, just remember size-wise that what we're talking about, guys, is we, we took a two by two matrix here times a two by one column, right? So just to get the sizes here to make sure that it makes sense. The result of this is a two by one column. I know it looks as wide as it does tall, but it's actually a single column here, uh, not to be confused with being like a two by two matrix or anything, okay? So that would be, uh, that would be it. And then so finally, um, step three, Step three is where we just, uh, what's it say over there? General solution, the complementary function plus the particular solution. Let's just write it down for the record. Uh, you guys are more than welcome to just put the step three just like this. You know, if you don't want to take the time to fill everything in again, you can do that. Lots of people did that on my uh, midterm on Tuesday and it was totally okay with me. Same thing here, but just so we can look at it one time, uh, this would be the C1 e to the 3t times the vector negative 1, 1, plus C2, e to the t, times 1, 1, and then plus this particular solution that we just worked out here, e to the t plus 2t, e to the t, and negative e to the t plus 2t, e to the t. There you go. This is the general solution to our non-homogeneous system. Complementary function plus the particular solution. So that step is, is pretty much just writing it down. Um, if you had an initial value, right, if they gave you x of 0, then now would be the time that you would plug 0 in everywhere for t and a solve for c1 and c2. Basically what you would have to do at that point. What do you guys think? Does this all make pretty decent sense? No questions at all here? But you can see, like to do the inverse of a three by three matrix, we don't have a nice formula here. That's why more than likely, I'm only gonna ask you to do a two by two. There's a, so we've done one example here. Uh, I have a homework assignment for you to do for Sunday, which is to just do two of these, just to get it into your blood, you know, make sure you understand it a little bit. So there's a couple of them for you to try for Sunday. There's gonna be one on the group work we're going to do here, and then in the review materials. So by the time we get to the exam, you probably will have seen about six of these. And hopefully that'll be enough that uh, you feel pretty comfortable with how it works. Are there any questions at all on that? Non-homogeneous linear systems and differential equations. It's variation of parameters all over again, just with vectors instead of scalars. Otherwise, it's all just the same stuff. Okay. You guys really do look sad. Yeah, we are. We are. This is it. I mean, we're kind of done with the material. I know this. You know, actually, if you look at, at the book, there is so much more in there. And, and we were pretty packed for 15 weeks doing stuff. There's a lot more. There's Laplace transforms. 
There's series solutions to differential equations. Uh, all of that, those sections get covered in either Math 310 or 406. Um, so, you know, you, you can take the book and turn it into three classes worth of material if you really wanted to. Um, certainly, we, we filled up a full classes worth here, I would say. So, um, all right, well, I will leave it at that. Um, as you're working on the homework and reflecting on things, I'm sure you'll let me know if you have any questions on it. Uh, but I think I'm going to try to fire up this projector. Uh, I take a minute to get this. Oh, it's already up. Um, what I'd like to do next, guys, is talk a little bit about final exam. But the rest of today, we're just going to review and just kind of get our heads around what what's the task is before us for the next um, five days to kind of get ready for the final. Uh, as I mentioned, we have this one homework assignment, uh, the last assignment for the semester, which is due on Sunday. Um, and I will post the solutions to that uh, probably on Monday morning or something. Um, but you'll have just a little bit of practice on the stuff we just learned here. Uh, so other than that, the main thing I want to go into here is the final exam resources folder, which is up here at the top, the very first folder in the file section. Let's go ahead and open this up. Oh boy, it's the same thing that we have seen so many other times with the midterms. Um, and so what you see here is about eight documents or so. There's a Two sample finals again. Uh, so I would recommend that everybody try at least one of those. Maybe uh, I wouldn't necessarily start with that. Maybe plan on either Sunday or Monday uh, trying at least one of those sample finals. If you try one of them and you're like, yeah, I don't know if I feel too good yet, maybe try the other one as well. Uh, I've got solutions, full blown solutions written out for those so you can. Consult with those, um, but be careful about just reading my answers to everything. Um, I know that's tempting and it's certainly efficient with time, but it can leave people a false sense of um, feeling on top of everything when they're really not. It's, it's one thing to be able to read my solutions and follow along and say, yeah, yeah, that all makes sense. But it's another thing altogether to kind of produce it for yourself. So try to avoid just reading the solutions if you can. Uh, do your best to really challenge yourself to solve these problems, knowing that this is just practice, right? Um, the other thing you can do is come to my office hours, which I'm going to uh, talk about in a few minutes, and just have me uh, hammer you with questions. Uh, you know, if you say, oh, I'm, I'm really weak on linear transformations. Uh, what could we practice? Or I'm really not getting the defective linear systems. What could we practice? And I'm happy to uh, do what I can uh, to help you with that. Um, there is also a final exam review session, so this will have some practice problems in it, and then I have typed out the solutions to all of those practice problems, but I wanted to mention that I also have the video for this. Oh, actually, the video is a little different. Um, let me show you the video piece. I'm going to go to pages real quick and just show you there is a final exam review session, but this one's looking a little different than what you've seen before. It's actually a whole bunch of videos. So the way to treat this uh, page, and I really should try to clean this up a little bit better sometime, but what it is, is it's clips of different topics, and I tried to explain what's in each clip. So like this first video is about an hour and a half long, and it covers chapter one, four, and five, which actually are probably the, the three chapters that are the rustiest for us because we haven't been doing chapter one lately um, or chapter four is kind of, I mean, subspaces and stuff like that, inner product spaces. We haven't done that since uh, October. So there's, you know, some older material there. Um, or uh, there's another video here that's about 30 minutes. It just says this is an overview of chapters one through five. So if you just wanna, if, if the first half of the semester is kind of just a fog right now for you, and you just want to spend 30 minutes just kind of listening to me talk through it again, uh, we can do that as well. Um, so there's a little video for that. So there's a bunch of videos here, guys, and you can read for yourself what is in each video. Uh, there's a lot of practice problems, right? But in terms of the topics, um, I'm not suggesting everybody watch all of this stuff. Um, if you do watch it, be sure to give it a like on your uh, YouTube channel. Um, but uh, yeah, do... 
take or leave whatever you want from this. Most of these are pretty short, like this is 13 minutes, here's 25 minutes, here's 16 minutes. Um, but yeah, I need to get this a little bit better organized at some point. Anyway, so that is the video that kind of goes with, let's go back here again, to the final example review session. Okay, however, having said all of that, um, I just did two review sessions last weekend for the midterm that you took on Tuesday, and I was blown away by, I really was stoked about the turnout. I, there were... 20 to 25 people both nights uh, at the review, which was awesome. I had stopped doing these in-person review sessions around the COVID time because nobody was coming around campus. And one time I prepared to do a review session and then I came and there was like nobody there. <laughs> I was like, okay, I guess I don't need to do the review session. So I kind of just put that on a, on a bit of a pause for a while, but then it feels like people are back engaged again on campus. And certainly the, the turnout for the review session this past weekend was awesome. Like not everybody came, of course, I didn't expect that, but the number of people who, who did come was really awesome. So I am going to do more review sessions again. So if you don't wanna watch all those videos that I just showed you, and you just wanna come live to a review session, I will uh, talk to you about that here in a second. Uh, by the way, our final is on Tuesday. And be careful, it is at 9 a.m. So we start an hour early. This is not my choice. I would be in bed at 9 a.m. if I could. Uh, but <laughs> we are going to start at 9 until 11. So it's two hours. I'll try to give you a little extra time um, as much as I'm able to. Um, so there might be a chance for that. We'll just have to see how it goes. It'll be in this room. Of course, I'm going to give you the same old table of annihilators and integrals. Anything I gave you on an old exam. So I gave you the Gram-Schmidt formulas before. I will give those to you again. I'm also going to give you the, the uh, differential equation for the mixing problems because uh, that's something I gave you all along. Um, so I won't start taking things away. I'll just give you all of that stuff again. Um, but anyway, I am going to do two review sessions again. And I'm going to do them at exactly the same times that I did the review sessions last week because those times obviously work pretty well for a lot of people. So on Sunday at four o'clock, and again on Monday at seven o'clock, in this room, I'm gonna do uh, a review session. So we'll take two hours and do whatever we can do. Okay, I'll do as many problems as, as I have time for. I'm also gonna be cranking up extra office hours on Sunday, Monday. This is what Wednesday does not really apply for you guys, but on Sunday and Monday, Monday, I'm gonna be basically around um, all afternoon and evening. Uh, with the review session in between in the middle. So I'll be very available to help um, you guys with questions as you're coming along. You can also just, honestly, I'm around a lot more than those hours. I'll probably be in on Saturday and probably be in on Friday. I just don't have the hours spelled out, but you're always welcome to study outside of my office. Uh, that place is always open. Um, the exam will be comprehensive. And I'm promising some problem from this material will for sure be on the final. Um, I'm probably going to set this one up. So we haven't had any extra credit to do for this exam uh, per se. Uh, by the way, we didn't make 90% <laughs> SOQs. Uh, I, pr I might give you the points anyway. What happened, I think, was that there's like four people that stopped coming to class and stopped checking their email. and. Um, so that was enough people to like pull my average down in terms of uh, completion ratio. I'll probably just throw those points your way anyway. Um, but um, the main thing that I'm going to be basically doing is um, I'm probably gonna make the, the exam worth well over a hundred points. Uh, I'm probably only going to grade it out of 100 points. So what I mean is there might be like a hundred and, well, I mean, so there might be 120 points and so if you do everything right, you get 120% on the final. What I'm saying is that um, you would have like 20 points. And I don't know for sure because I haven't written the test yet, but you have some amount of points that is just sort of floater points, extra points that, you know, you could either skip a problem or you could still do everything and just uh, take as many points as you can get. And it could be more than 100% of, of the points. So that's probably what I'll do instead of trying to concoct some kind of extra credit at the last minute right now. 
Um, I'd rather have people just get ready for the for the final. Um, I have some advice in here about studying a little bit. Um, you know, I wouldn't try to go back to all the homework. I wouldn't try to read the book in detail. I would focus on uh, sections that you find are your weakness and maybe review the notes from the class on those sections or even rewatch some of the videos if you thought that might help. Um, the group work would be something worth doing. We have about 15 of those that we've done. Um, and some of those are probably going to cover topics that uh, would be of interest to each of you. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's that's just some generic advice about uh, the test. By now, you guys have seen kind of how I do my tests and stuff. Um, then I have a few practice problems here. Uh, these are mainly focused just on the material here at the end of the semester. So uh, again, you don't have to do these necessarily. I would focus on the sample finals, maybe reviewing the group works, and then hitting sections that feel like maybe are a little weak for you. And that might be good enough uh, for you guys. You also have, of course, <laughs> the resources folders for all three midterms, which has two sample midterms plus the one that you took in it. So, oh my gosh, this is like so many exams to go back and review. It's almost too much. Uh, you really can't do all of that much. Um, I want everybody to get a little sleep along the way as well. And some rest, I think, is very important. But um, yeah, I, I would recommend, I think, one or two of the sample finals. And if you can come to the review session, great. I'm going to try to re uh, record the review session. Um, I know I've been having some trouble with my video recordings. I think I'm going to use a different software and try to get a very good quality video for that in case you can't make it. The review sessions will be similar, but maybe not exactly the same problems. So if you can come to one of them, but not the other, that's fine. Uh, but I'll send you the video for both of them in case that might be helpful. Uh, and we kind of kind of go from there. So uh, does anybody have any questions about any of that? Uh, Audrey? Um, I'm going to ask questions from chapters one, from all of the chapters, but what I'm saying is that in studying for this third midterm, you had to know how to do determinants. You had to know how to find null spaces, right? You had, so that was reviewing stuff that actually were skills from earlier. That's all that I meant by that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'll have some straight, you know, questions from determinants, just back to chapter three again. I'll have something about um, that, I'm sure. Uh, subspaces, uh, you know, verifying closure under addition and scalar multiplication, things of that nature. I'm sure that uh, that kind of stuff will be in my mind as I'm putting the test together. And you're going to see it when you start digging into these sample tests. Okay. They're not going to be all that different. Um, okay. Uh, the other thing is, so I, I'm going to pass back your exams and we're going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, on the grade sheet in Canvas, um, I've now updated the midterm scores uh, with the three exams you've had. Your homework is pretty much what it is. So you'll see over in that uh, grade sheet, it kind of tells you where you stand right now. Um, keep in mind that you actually stand a little bit better than what it says in there. And that's because uh, at the end of the semester, I will be re-weighting your grade. Um, just to remind you how that works, I'm going to take your three midterms and your homework and your final, those five parts of your grade, and whichever of those five parts for you personally was your best part, highest percentage, I'm going to make it count an extra 5% of weight, right? And then I'm going to take that 5% away from whichever of your five components was the lowest part, right? So if you had a weak uh, midterm along the way and a strong midterm, I'm going to make the strong midterm count 5% more than it says it does in the syllabus. And I'm going to make the weaker midterm count 5% less than it does. This will have the effect of boosting your grade by, I'll just give you the historical sort of rough idea. It usually makes about a three to 4% difference. So if it says online right now that you have a 70% in this class, I'm fine with you just thinking of it that way, that you have a 70%. 
But in the back of your mind, uh, you can know that actually it's probably a little bit better than that. It's probably like 73%, uh, something like that. And so that reweighting hasn't happened yet. And um, so it's a little bit unclear exactly what your grade is, obviously, at this moment, because I can't do that reweighting until we actually have the final exam in our hands. But um, we'll get that we'll get that figured out uh, soon enough, obviously. Um, so I think I'll, what I'll do is I'm going to pass back to this exam and then we'll take a 10 minute break. You can um, get some fresh air, uh, stretch your legs for a few minutes. And then the last half of the class today, we're just going to review a little bit. I'm going to go back and review. As far as this exam goes, um, it was a mixed bag, I would say. Uh, there are some people this was their best exam of the three. Uh, there was also some people that this one was their weakest exam. I, that's why I just went over the reweighting <laughs> thing because for some people this one's going to get more weight for some people it's going to get a little bit less weight but it was a bit of a of a mixed bag i do i do think that the the people who are really kind of sticking to it and uh playing the game are, are doing really well i had i had a 103 i had a 98 and a half i had a 92 and a half and i need some four people above 90 percent um quite a number in the 80s and 70s as well. The problem is, I don't know what it is, this class has an average that's much lower than my afternoon class. And I don't think it's because, I think the, the top of both classes is the same, pretty much the same. Both classes have lots of 90s and 80s showing up, but in this class, and I'm really speaking to people who aren't here, there's about 10 people who, if I asked them to find an eigenvalue of a matrix right now, they wouldn't have a clue what to do. I just, it's, just, I don't know what I can do about that. It's just, um, just hasn't sunk in somehow. Um, just haven't done what we needed to do to get on top of it. It seems to be the morning class has been an issue with that. Not so much the people that are here, uh, but some of the folks that are just kind of showing up uh, once a month to take a test and pulling my average way down. So I don't know what it says the average is. I think the average, I didn't do a combined average, but it was it was over 50%, but it wasn't tremendously great. But when I thought about it, I was like, why is the average so low when I have a 103 and a 99 and a 93 and a 91 and all this stuff? And the reason is because I also have people that couldn't hardly get up to 20 points on this test for some reason. I just don't know how that how that happens unless they're just really checked out. So there is a little bit of that uh, going on. I don't even really look at the average uh, to to assess what how the exam was because I think it's really more about sort of the if I took the average of you guys, I'm sure it would be like much much higher than what it shows in uh, in Canvas. So I really appreciate the hard work uh, that you know most people are doing. Um, it's just that the numbers do get skewed a little bit sometimes, but um, yeah, let's just keep keep doing the best that we can, and hopefully everything's going to go well with the final as well. So I'm going to go ahead and pass these back to the people who are here. Angela, also quite a few people missing. There's still 31 people enrolled in this class. Adam, Julia, Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Isaac. Austin. Margo. Let's see, Robert here. Now, here. Erickson I'm here. Uh, Gwendolyn. Bryce is here. Nathan is here. Thomas. Here. Here. Jason. Robert's not here. Bryce. And Alex. From Jerry and uh, Leo, Eduardo, Gilbert. Okay, and Eduardo. Mm -hmm. He's going to go walk. 
That should be everybody. Did everybody get their test? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break. Uh, if you wanna stretch your legs for a few minutes, feel free to do that. And then we'll come back and we'll do some uh, reviewing for the final. Oh, you know why? Because X still stays in the room. That was X still one. This, if it's X still zero, that means they don't have some chance to be in the that are actually on it. Like I mean, this is a long state so I'll Okay, so stuff like that. Yeah, I would focus on the stuff that is on the yeah. Now, like, for example, in this midterm, I gave you a defective system where the matrix has fixed eigenvalues. Yeah. Um, that might mean that I could do that same thing again, or on the final, I might ask you a defective system that's one of the other cases. Like, so the right yeah. Cases. So um, I, you shouldn't just assume that something that wasn't on the midterm would definitely not be on the final, but it would have to be, I think, Maybe think of it not so much as just what was on the midterms, but and what was in know. all of the reviews of for the midterms. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that would be the best way. Right. So it is. <laughs> That's one that I told you before. Your bar, I actually wrote it down. Yeah. Oh my God! When I started listening to people um, who were using Indian lady with the blue, they were saying so many things about like this for the things. I'm just like. Or this one? Yeah. What do you think of this one? It's a one degree of the early one, bro. I don't know what you mean. Is it? Oh, yeah, that one. Probably like seven minutes left. I got one. Eh. Maybe. I don't think Some pepper on my food every time is it bad if I say not so much. No. <laughs> yeah, but it, tell pepper, dude. Like enough where I can just see like like the distance of the peppers are like this big. Like it's just like so much pepper. Like brown pepper, like brown Yeah. Like a lot, like where I can just taste the pepper. 
<laughs> Should I just yes, but then I feel like such a like well, light fine. pepper, you know. They just put so much. Yeah, it's like too much. They do. I didn't. You get your food. You can shake it out. I mean, I would look at it and be like, I would not put that much pepper in something. Like for anybody, it's like an omelet, and they just dump the pepper in there. Just dump salt in. Ugh. I don't even eat I don't even eat pepper like at all on my face. Yeah, maybe I should just put no pepper. <laughs> I just don't like it that much. Yeah, I'm gonna say no pepper. They can't mess that up. They they might be slightly. What? Yeah, they might I'm listening, I'm buying a bagel. Some things I didn't cover. Oh, maybe for the second one, I should do that. So, I'm not really going to go in order that way. I think I think I'm just going to jump into the room, however the spirit moves me. Uh, it's just because I can come on Sunday, but I can't come on. Well, then what I'll do is I'll do Sunday's review, and then I'll explain at the end of that review. Here are the things that I didn't get to do that I think would still be good to review. Um, and I'm going to probably review them in the second session. If you can't come, then that's your cue yeah. to watch the video or just review it on your own. Yeah, mm -hmm. makes sense? Thank you. Yeah, sure. sure. That's why I do it twice. Because I, I yeah. figure I can't find times at like 30 yeah. times. Anyway, yeah, I want to ask you guys what should we be trusting in order to be like real security? You couldn't even give me a little bit of a brain. I mean, I'm assuming you are Omar Gates and I am all Mondays, you guys have your finals. All Mondays, you guys have your finals. And Friday. I'll be in Hawaii later. Well, I think it's okay. I'm just more of a relaxation trip with my family, but I, I'm going to try to take a day to go sign the ball at the just so they'll, they'll give me permission to do it. Somebody's gonna have to drop it off at the trailhead. That one on the big island? Yeah. You said yeah. yeah. It's the yeah. smallest volcano in the world. It's like, really it's like, it's like it's 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 taller than it is. It's half of that rest of the It's like a lot. And it's the highest. Did you roll it? It's much stress. You get like, I don't know why. They always sit for a second. Yeah, and then they go. So I don't know why it did. Because if they knew you, like they, they saw me across yeah. the street and they recognized me, yeah, probably like you were. I was like, uh, um, but that one second was enough for me to like, hustle. so yeah, run. I wake up just great. Like, just oh, I guess I did. <laughs> yeah, looks I'm gonna get Starbucks too. I'm gonna pig out. <laughs> okay, Starbucks and that thing. I literally did the same one every winter. Like within like one percent, which is really weird. And I just always make like I never like mess up where I like. It's always my mess. 
which kind of sucks. First day everybody was there. Suddenly, so, by that, by the reactor, we had a session. Wait, no, we're supposed to start by the final matter is more. Yeah. There's probably nobody there. <laughs> they need to have their conferences in uh, um, North Dakota or something. Yeah. Or there's nothing to do except go to the conference. <laughs> I'm only five minutes ago. Well, I like I more because um, Kauai is a wild a place, place and there's some great hiking there along the Nepali coast. It's just these green, lush mountains dropping into the sea and with little beaches on the shoreline. And you can backpack and hike um, in that very remote part of the, of the island. So it's like Oahu is more the most civilized, like Honolulu is big city, big airport, lots of people there. Uh, but I am going there because um, part of my family has never been to Hawaii, and so you can't really go to Hawaii without just spending some time in Waikiki and that sort of thing. So, yeah, so I, anyway, by next Friday, I'll be I'm taking off pretty much right after finals. So. Okay, guys, uh, I think uh, hopefully everybody's made it back from the break here. Um, I think what I'm going to do, I, by the way, again, if you have any questions about your midterm, um, how either how it was graded or even a question about like, you, you still don't think you understand how to do those problems, uh, be sure to uh, reach out to me. Uh, check the solutions, of course. I've posted those online. If there's still some uh, any confusion whatsoever, I really do mean it. Um, I want you to, I really do want you to learn this stuff well. Uh, this is my goal. Um, um, I genuinely want everybody to succeed and feel really good about their knowledge. So if you're still feeling shaky on anything from that midterm, uh, it's not a burden to me to stop by my, anytime my office door is open, you're always welcome. Uh, you can ask me a question. If I'm sincerely busy, I will let you know. But most of the time, uh, this is my biggest priority. This is why I'm here, uh, is to help you guys learn the, the material. So if I can be of any help, either with that midterm or as you're kind of transitioning towards thinking about the final, uh, definitely uh, let me know. Gosh, you know, to think about how to study for this 15 weeks that we've just been through is a little bit difficult. Uh, you could, uh, you know, start from chapter one and go straight through to chapter nine, I suppose, just kind of go in order. Uh, certainly with 35 minutes or whatever we have left today, we're not going to be able to get that deep into it. Uh, but what I think I might do is sort of start by giving you a, a roadmap through the differential equations portion of the course. Remember that the linear algebra is often a tool to help us with the differential equations. That's one of the reasons that we teach the two subjects together. So there is going to be linear algebra, you know, interwoven with most of these topics. But I do think that um, in some sense, from a practical perspective and from an engineering perspective, the differential equations um, roadmap is one that is very important for you guys to learn. And so um, if we are handed a problem about differential equations on the final, I'd like to give you maybe a little bit of a roadmap about how you might want to think about it. OK, so uh, so let's just say um, I'm going to call this a differential equations roadmap. I'm going to draw a little picture here. And then once we've got this roadmap drawn, we're going to practice the roadmap on a group work, which we're just going to do together in class. OK, so if you see a differential equation, there's a series of questions that I think would be good to ask about it. And the first question that I might ask is, is it a system of differential equations? Like That's one of the uh, important things to know. Are we talking about a single unknown function? with one scalar differential equation, or is it actually a bunch of unknown functions? So this would be a good place to start your, your analysis of the problem. And so this is either going to be obviously yes or no, okay? Now, if it is a system of differential equations, then what that means is that we are in chapter nine. Right, so then we're looking at you know x prime, whoops, sorry, x prime equals equals a x 
And I'm going to add the plus B now that we just learned about that today. This would be what a system of differential equations would look like. And the, then some of the questions we could ask now would be, is it homogeneous? Homogeneous meaning um, is the B part zero, right? So again, this could be either yes or no, right? So if it's a yes, then guys, if it's a system of differential equations and it's, I'm sorry, if it's a no, if it's not homogeneous, then that's actually section 9.6. That's the, I'm just trying to place this material for you a little bit. If it's a system of differential equations that is not homogeneous, we just learned today how to solve those. And I have already promised you there will be at least one time on the exam next Tuesday where that turns out to be the right answer. So it's actually from that section. Otherwise, if it is homogeneous, then of course the system is really just X prime equals AX. And what might be a, a question that we would think about for this homogeneous system that would help us kind of figure out what we're gonna have to do? Um, you, you're talking about the most number of derivatives? Yeah, yeah. Well, so this is always going to be a first order linear system of differential equations. So that that part is kind of, that's all we've really talked about. It's not that you can't do more than that, but that's probably all that we've talked about. Do you have a thought? If, if it's a defective or a non-defective system, that's right. So is a, I would probably ask, is a defective, right? Is it defective? So this is another good question, right? It's either yes or no, yeah? <clears throat> and if it's defective, then we have to use the Ws, right? The, this is where we do, uh, if it's a yes, then we either have, you know, mixed eigenvalue or it's regular defective or it's super defective. There were some people on the uh, midterm. Uh, there was a, I forget exactly what the matrix was, but there was a three by three matrix on the midterm where I told you that the eigenvalues were negative one and three, but I didn't give you the multiplicities of those eigenvalues. So you had to use the trace fact, the, the fun facts about eigenvalues to figure out what the other eigenvalue was. And it turned out to also be negative one. And, um, but there were some people who didn't actually find three solutions to the system. They just found one here and one here, and they wrote that one down and they wrote that one down and they skipped the whole W stuff. So they basically just said, I'm just gonna write my general solution with two terms, uh, which are corresponding to the eigenvectors for those two eigenvalues without realizing that a three by three system has to have three terms to it. So um, what happened was that this eigenvalue was defective. So the, on the midterm that you just took, there was a mixed eigen, by this should say mixed eigenvalue. There was a mixed eigenvalue case on the exam that we just took, right? So um, just make sure guys, if it's a three by three system, it's got to have three solutions. So if you're only finding two eigenvectors, no, no need to panic. That just means it was defective. And so we're going to have to use the uh, use the W, use this stuff. Remember that we just learned last week, W1 going to W2 and W2 going to zero. And actually, when I think about it, it was this kind of thing that really was the, it really hurt some people on the exam. Like, like yeah, I took off a point here or a point there if you made sign errors or if you got the lambdas wrong or something. But when people just completely didn't do the whole W thing because they just found the eigenvectors and wrote down two terms, then I had to take off like, I think this was a 13 point problem and I had to take off most of the credit because it's like, well, the whole point of the question was to see this W stuff. So um, just be careful with that. Um, if it's a super defective one, by the way, you're going to have a W3, 4, and 5 as well. We did not have that on this midterm, uh, but it's definitely going to be uh, worth reviewing. Um, yeah, in the case when A is not defective, well, then we can just find our eigenpairs and we are good to go. I would say that uh, the one on the exam uh, was a Floy problem because there were imaginary 
eigenvalues for that one. So you might, you could ask another question here. Uh, are the lambdas complex? And that's, you know, either yes or no. If yes, then we need to know how to do Floyd. So I just want to put that on the board again. Uh, this was another thing that if people didn't do Floyd for whatever reason, it was, that was a big killer because I had to take off quite a bit of points just because that's a whole big topic that definitely need to know about. Um, but in any case, both of these types of problems are in 9.4. This stuff here is from 9.5. Okay, so this is a, a nice, this half of my roadmap is really a good uh, summary of chapter nine. So kind of the chapter nine stuff. Okay, if it's not a system of differential equations, meaning that it's just a single differential equation, what might be a question about it that you might want to ask early on? What's something that's important about that differential equation? What is order itself? What were you going to say? Oh, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Yeah, exactly. So if, the, if it's not a system, then I would just say, uh, what is the order? That's the n value that we usually talk about. The n is the order of the differential equation. And that order could be uh, more than one, or it could be equal to one. It, either one of those would be, would be possible. Um, and these are really the, the way you want to break this down, because if it's more than one, then we are actually in chapter eight. Otherwise, if it's equal to one, then that takes us all the way back to chapter one. Okay. So in terms of where is this stuff in the book, where was it in our semester, this is kind of helping you to lay that out a little bit. Okay. Um, let's do the chapter eight part first, because that's more fresh in our mind. If we have a higher order differential equation, of course, we tend to write it in this compact notation, L of Y equals F. And um, I think we fairly well know how to solve those. There are sort of two um, techniques here that are very important to refresh our memories about. You guys did a pretty good job, I'd say, on the exam, though, with this. The annihilators method, uh, this was in section 8.3. And then there's the variation of parameters, which we uh, also uh, use quite often. Um, and that was in 8.7. By the way, all of this was on, on the midterm. I managed to ask almost everything on the test uh, on Tuesday. But, uh, you know, just make sure you know these techniques. I, I don't think you're going to need to study this part too much. Chapter 8, I think, for the most part, is pretty, pretty good. Of course, look over your midterm. Make sure that any loose ends are cleared up with that. But I'm hoping that that's pretty solid. What I really wanted to talk a little more about, though, is... What about these first order differential equations? Because this takes us back to something that um, maybe is not as fresh because we didn't study this uh, recently. Um, this was before we did any linear algebra at all, right? And so a first order differential equation, there were four main types that we learned, okay? Uh, the very first one that we learned was the separable differential equations. So this is the one where you um, you separate the x's and y's onto opposite sides of the equal sign. It's totally an algebra thing. So you're just manipulating the equation algebraically to get the uh, x's on one side, the y's on the other side. And then if you remember, the, the way you solve a separable differential equation is you just integrate both sides. And you, if possible, you try to solve for y. Um, if that's not possible, then we can just give an implicit solution. That's basically the idea behind that. Then there was the linear first order differential equations. I'm gonna put a little star on my uh, roadmap here so that I can come over here and just next to this star, I want to remind you about a couple of things with linear equations, because there's some, some formulas here. A linear equation will have this general form, y prime plus e of x times y, equals q of x. Okay, so it's going to have that general form. And the does anybody remember what we use to solve this one, Angela? I equals e to the e to the integral. integral. 
e of x dx, right? Does anybody remember what this was called? And that's it. This is the integrating factor. Very good. So we have the, the so-called integrating factors here. Um, and so the way this works is, I'm just reminding you here, you, you, what you should be doing right now, guys, is just take some mental notes. Okay, do you remember all this or not? If not, then put it down to go back to this again later. We're not going to have time to review the whole thing right now. But what happens is you end up getting the derivative of the product of i with y on the left side, and the right-hand side just becomes q of x times i. And from there, you can solve for y by just integrating both sides and then dividing by the integrating factor at the end. Okay, so this is a little bit of review. Uh, by the way, I should put the sections down. The separable equations, that was 1.4. Linear equations are in 1.6. Um, and if you see any topics where you're like, oh, yeah, I totally need to review that. Of course, it's OK to go back to some of the homework problems. Like if there's if you're like, yeah, I never really understood how to do linear equations, then by all means, uh, feel free to hit that a little harder. Go back to your homework from that section. Take a problem or two. You don't need to do you know, that much. It, it, I promise you, if you do like less than 30 minutes on it, like maybe one problem, maybe two at the most, you will totally have this back down in your head again. It's not like you're learning it from scratch for the first time. It'll probably, to be honest with you, it'll probably seem a whole lot easier now, right? In the big picture compared to everything that we've done, uh, this stuff is pretty elementary stuff. Um, right, so that's the linear differential equations. And then in section 1.8, we learned two more types of differential equations. So again, this is taking us way back to September. We learned about something called a Bernoulli differential equation. I'm going to put a double star on that one because I'm going to say some words on the side on that as well in a moment. And then there was also something called a homogeneous uh, differential equation, I'll say, of degree zero. <clears throat> and maybe I'll put a triple star on that one. <laughs> Okay, so just quickly want to remind you, uh, honestly, this is the main uh, part of chapter one. There were a couple of other little things like um, the applications to mixing problems as well as, uh, I think we talked about Newton's law of cooling. Um, if you go back to the review packet, you'll see some of those words to, to refresh your memory about some of that, but honestly, the bulk of chapter one is going to be uh, this stuff right here. Okay, so let me put a double star here really quickly. So I've got one star for the linear part. Here's the double star for the Bernoulli part. Uh, just to remind you how this works, the Bernoulli looks almost the same as the linear one. The only difference is that on the right-hand side, so we still have the y prime plus p of x times y, but on the right-hand side, we have q of x times y to the n. So the big difference is here on the far right side, the y to the n piece, okay? And in order to solve this one, the trick is to do a change of variables. And uh, the change of variables that you need is, I used a u for this when we went over this. u is going to be equal to y raised to the power of 1 minus n, okay? <clears throat> By the way, in my weekend review sessions, I'm for sure going to be doing some of these so uh, as well. So I will not let you forget this stuff. Uh, so there's the change of variables. And then when you implement that change of variables, you need to know what you end up with as far as a new differential equation goes. So you get a new differential equation, which is actually u prime plus, actually it's going to have a constant in front here, 1 minus n times p of x times u, and this is going to end up being equal to 1 minus n times q of x. So all three of those equations are pretty important to, to being able to, you have to be able to recognize the Bernoulli equation. Then the n value here, it plays a very important role in the change of variables that you actually use, as well as in the new transformed equation here. This one always turns back into linear. So the Bernoulli equations, you might remember from chapter one, Bernoulli equations always become linear 
when you do this change of variables. Okay, so that is um, certainly a worthwhile thing to review. Um, it's actually, you know, Bernoulli equations actually do show up on a lot of my final exams. If you probably, if you look at the sample tests, you're going to see them there. And one reason I like to ask about Bernoulli equations is that it showcases this important change of variables technique. And it also does incorporate linear differential equations as well, because you have to solve for u here using the, the linear stuff, the integrating factors. So you solve for u, and then once you've solved for u, you have to convert back in terms of y again through that change of variables. So there's quite a bit there to kind of uh, keep track of, okay? Now, again, I'm going to probably make this exam out of more than 100%. So, you know, if there happens to be some topic that you just aren't good with, uh, that we've had a ton of topics this semester, and you can't punt on everything. But if there's a topic or two here or there that you're like, yeah, I don't know if I feel up for that, um, you're probably going to be, you're going to have a little bit of a grace uh, period, or not grace period, grace cushion of points, basically. To, to, to skip something if you needed to, but let's try not to make it this. This is pretty, you know, you don't have to think that conceptually here. You just have to be able to turn yourself into a machine and go through the process uh, of what these equations are telling you to do. Okay, the triple star is the, uh, the homogeneous of degree zero. This is also done using a change of variables. So this is also from 1.8 as well. And for this one, uh, what you're looking at is your differential equation has this kind of a setup. You just solve for y prime, completely isolate the y prime. And then the key thing is the way you'll know that it's homogeneous is if over here on this, whatever is on the right-hand side, which is a bunch of x's and y's, if those x's and y's can just cancel back out when you attach a t to them. So if I just replace x with xt and I replace y with yt, if they cancel right back out again, then it's homogeneous of degree zero. And the change of variables for this one, uh, I used a V for this, is just Y equals X V. And that's basically it. Uh, this will, I can't write down what it's turning into. All I, all I can say is it, it becomes separable. So homogeneous differential equations always become separable while the Bernoulli equations always become linear. That's kind of the way the change of variables will work. It's worth noting here that uh, you're going to need to take the derivative of y because you see that y prime has to be replaced here. Uh, so that's just the product rule of x and v. So x times the derivative of v plus v times the derivative of x, but the derivative of x is just one. So this is also a part of the change of variables here. And you just go through and you just replace everywhere you see y, you change it to xv. Everywhere you see y prime, which is just going to be on the left side, you just change it to xv prime plus v. And then what you're going to have is a separable differential equation for v that you have to solve. So that's another important thing from, from chapter one. Okay. This class is differential equations and linear algebra. It is really, I would say, roughly almost exactly 50-50 of each. And the 50% of the differential equation stuff is mostly now at least overviewed on the board here. Um, chapters 1, 8, and 9. Uh, I think personally, for most of you, chapter 1 will be the thing to focus on a little bit more um, because it's not as fresh in, in mind. And I will have chapter one on this uh, final. I think it's an important, these differential equations come up all the time. Separable, linear, really homogeneous. So it's really a, a good thing to walk out of this class kind of knowing how to do. Uh, not that the side of the board over here is not important. It's just that this is probably fresher in my head. We just learned how to do non-defective and defective linear systems. Today, we learned how to do non-homogeneous linear systems. So this stuff is really, really current. Um, and <clears throat> unless you really didn't get to prepare for midterm three the way you wanted to, uh, my guess is most, most folks have had a, a pretty good look at 
chapters eight and nine. It's really this chapter one part that we might need a little bit more work on. So I put together, yeah, Audrey? Okay. Yeah. You will only see it for order two. Yeah, uh, on that chapter eight thing, I would not give you that for any higher order because it's just too hard to do it by hand. Um, I'm passing out a, a, a group work here. We're not actually going to do it as a group work. Instead, I'm going to talk with you through it. Kind of let us just kind of test in a few minutes just looking at these. I want to pass it back. This is group work 16, which is in Canvas. And we are, the goal here with this group work, guys, is not to solve all six of these right now. <laughs> We would need another hour to do that. Uh, instead, I just want to go through on the roadmap and figure out where they belong. Okay, that's really all I want to do. So we'll see if we can do this in just a few short minutes. Um, and then as far as how to actually solve the problems, um, that'll be something you can review. The solutions to this group work have all the full blown answers to all these problems in them. So let's take a look at them together. Let's look at the first one. I'm going to write it on the board here. Uh, as well. So the, the question is y minus x dy dx equals 3 minus 2x dy dx. So let's just try out our little uh, roadmap. So is this a system of differential equations? No, it's not a system. What is the order of that differential equation? The highest derivative that I see is first order. So we're thinking chapter one, right? It's got to be in chapter one. So we've got some options here. Could be separable, could be linear, could be Bernoulli, could be homogeneous. Um, does anybody see any uh, or have any suggestions on how to figure that part out? Angela? Thank you. Okay, maybe I could subtract the 3 over with the y, and then I can put the 2 dy over dx's together. So the x, if I add x dy dx to what was negative 2x dy dx, that would just give me negative x dy dx on the right side. So this is usually going to take just a little bit of algebra to get it separated, right? But you can see that that's exactly what's happening. And now um, I'm going to move the y minus 3 underneath of the dy. And then I'm going to pull the dx to the left side. I have a minus of a 1 over x on the other side. And yep, that is now separable. Okay, so that would be a separable differential equation. That look okay? Yeah, so that's uh, that's separate. So, so part A is separable. You get it separated, and then you just have to integrate both sides and solve for y. So that's kind of how that works. Okay, let's look at the next one. Uh, let's look at part B. Part B, we have x1 prime equals negative 6x1 plus x2 plus 1. And we also have x2 prime equals 6x1 plus, sorry, minus 5x2 plus e to the negative t. Okay, so here's the question. Is that a system of differential equations? Sure, sure looks like it. Uh, is it homogeneous? Is there a, so, so if I, I can think of the left side as the derivative of x, I see a two by two matrix here, right? The negative six, the one, the six, and the negative five, right? But there is this part, right? That, that's the plus b part. That's the non-homogeneous term, the one and the e to the negative t. If those had not been there, it would have been homogeneous. But the addition of those terms at the end makes it non-homogeneous. So this one is uh, the stuff we just learned how to do today. So if you're looking for another practice example, you can read my solutions to group work 16, part B. And uh, I worked out the full details of that problem there. Okay, so that's a good example. All right, let's come back. Uh, let's look at the third case here. The third case is the sine of y over x times the quantity xy prime minus y equals x times the cosine of the quantity y over x. 
So is that a system of differential equations? That does not look like a system to me. It's just a single unknown function, just one equation there. That's all I have. So it's not a system. What is the order of this differential equation? It's just first order, right? It's just one derivative right here. We see y prime. There's no y double prime or triple prime or anything else. So it looks like we're back in chapter one again. So this problem is somewhere in this list here. Uh, anybody have any thoughts about which of the four types this one might be, uh, Julia? I was thinking Bernoulli because of the y over x. Um, the y over x actually reminds me of something else, to be honest with you. Not so much the Bernoulli. So the Bernoulli write-up is this piece. Oh, is where... it the, oh the ne I meant that one. Is that what you're Yeah. Thinking? Yeah, this is what I thought. Yeah. You yeah. See, here, if you solve for y over x, it just turns into v. So that's very, very uh, much a hint here, right? Because this would just become sine of V, right? The right-hand side would have X times the cosine of V. And then you'd have to do something here. We'd have to replace the Y prime. I have a formula there for what Y prime is. So we would replace that in here, and then the Y would turn into XV. So the key thing about this change of variables is make sure that you get rid of all of the Ys and turn them into Vs. You shouldn't have some Ys and some Vs at the same time. They should all be completely substituted. So this Y prime would be XV prime plus V right here. <laughs> and that can be simplified. You can, then, you can then work on simplifying it. The other way to approach this one is if you think it's homogeneous, before you actually do any uh, introducing of the Vs, you could isolate the Y prime first. So I could divide the sign to the other side, and then add y, and then divide by x, and try to get the y prime alone, because that's kind of how it's set up here. The y prime is by itself here. But yeah, this is this one is a homogeneous of degree zero. And again, I'm not going to take the time right now to solve it out, but uh, you do have solutions where it is fully solved out. Yeah. It'd be wrong to also like check t's. Oh, to check if it's homogeneous first? Absolutely not a bad thought to do that. Yeah, and so once I actually solve for Y prime, that's when you would want to do that. Yeah, I'd solve it for Y prime first and then check it with the T's. That, that's a really good point. Yeah, make sure that the T's cancel out fully uh, once you uh, solve for Y prime. Awesome. Questions here? Just trying to give you the big picture a little bit. Uh, part D. Let's see, part D, this is y double prime minus 8y prime plus 17y equals e to the 4x times the cosecant of x. I haven't seen cosecant very much this semester. <laughs> That's a little bit interesting. All right, is this a system of differential equations? Nope, it's just a single uh, differential equation. What is the order of this differential equation? Second order. Okay, so I'm going, it's a no, and then greater than one, so I'm in chapter eight. So now I'm looking at L of Y equals F. That's exactly what this would be structured as. And I have two methods. I have annihilators and I have variation of parameters. Does anybody uh, think one of those methods is more likely than the other to be good to go? Yeah, I would I would use the variation of parameters. By the way, guys, you did a great job on the midterm with this. I saw very few people trying to use annihilators to do a variation of parameters problem, and I saw very few people trying to use variation of parameters to do an annihilators problem. So keep up the good work on that. What's the reason that this would be variation of parameters? Second order, and we don't see cosecant of x in our table of integrals, right? Now, of course, cosecant of x, for those of you who have a little bit of your trig on the front of your mind, is really 1 over sine of x. Is it fair to say that we could use an annihilator now? Because, well, I do have e to the 4x in my table, and I have sine of x in my table. Can I make an annihilator work for this, though? You cannot, right? You can't just, you can't turn this into like d minus 4 over d squared plus 1. This just doesn't even make any sense to do that. Okay, I think I did see that one time uh, in, in my last couple of days of grading. Audrey? So, 
like it's an animator was in it. Uh huh. It was like, it's still you, you do it either. You can do it either way. The second order just could be shown. Right, right. You could actually do it either way. You could, if, if this was something that you did know how to annihilate, you could make a, a choice about it. And if I felt that either way was going to be equally easy, I probably would just say nothing. If I felt that one method was going to be far superior to the other, probably as your kind and gentle instructor, I might suggest you might want to use variation of parameters here or something like that. But I usually prefer to write questions where you guys are figuring out which which technique it really should be used. So, OK, um, let's see. Uh, part E is a trick question. <laughs> Part E is a trick question because uh, I won't write it down on the board, but there is no annihilator for the right-hand side, but the differential equation is third order. So we couldn't use the variation of parameters either. So it does say in the instructions, um, state that the, you can state that the equation cannot be solved by any technique that we have learned. So that, that would be that one. Part E would just be not a good question for us to do. And then finally, part F, would be linear. If we actually worked it out, uh, I can tell you it would turn out to be a linear equation. So that's how that one uh, would shake out. Um, so I'll let you look at the solutions to any of those that you would like to. Um, we have like one minute left and I have one last thing I need to do. This is the last day of my class and I've done it this way for 20 years or whatever, how long I've been here. Uh, if you guys don't mind, because this has been a very special time for me always to teach these classes. I really enjoy doing it. I would like to get a class picture really quick. And we can do it in front of our nice big roadmap up here. Uh, grab a photo of uh, all of us together. I'm going to go find somebody in the hallway to take our picture. Come on up and uh, Marco, can you rally people around and kind of get people lined up for me? Thanks. <laughs> Okay, we're not doing again next year. Maybe we're going to take two pictures because uh, there's there's a lot of there's nobody outside, so I need to do maybe two pictures. So can I have um, somebody from? I'm going to cut the light right here. I'm going to take a picture with you guys. I want to be in the picture. <laughs> uh, could you join them? And can I get maybe, Alex, would you take a picture of this part of the group first? And then we'll get you guys, we'll, that way we'll get everybody. Do you want a vertical? Uh, horizontals are usually really good for me. And the bird can I sit about right here? Sorry, is that there for a moment? <laughs> there we go. Now, can you see everybody here? Uh, all right, guys, pretend like you're having a good time. <laughs> Two, one. All right, take a couple. There we go. Nice. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I'm not seeing this. That's my problem. <laughs> I guess you don't sit down, do I? Let's get the rest of you guys kind of slide over by my roadmap here. And same thing. Um, and maybe um, just move that out of the way a little bit. I'll just stand up this time. I just uh, see if we can get everybody in here. Slide over a little bit. I think you can. If the dog needs to back up, you can. You guys like scooting. Get everybody scooting in a little bit. Here's a chair. If somebody want to sit down? Or you can just push the chair out of the way if it's not going to be used. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Sounds good. All right, guys, pretend like you're having a good time in this class. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. And, and guys, thank you really, seriously, for taking my class. You guys don't sign up for my class. I don't get to do this. I really do enjoy it. So, I'll send them out in the email. I'll send those out so you guys have a class there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.